Okay, so uh, I kind of wanted to start my talk today by just asking all of you three questions. So please raise your hand if any of these apply to you. Who among you here have a domestic worker? Yeah, yeah, good number of hands. Um, who among you here have spoken to a domestic worker or simply seen them lying on the streets, the busy streets of Causeway Bay, Central, Admiralty, or even Hong Kong? Guilty as charged. <laughs> um, or have you simply read about a domestic worker making major headlines on a, maybe a South China Morning Post article? They're everywhere, right? But they're not here. Why? Tete, Ate, Nana, or if you're where I'm from, Yaya. Yeah. One way or another, you've probably heard of, lived with, or simply spoken to a migrant domestic worker and heard about their significance to society. For me? Well, my appreciation for domestic workers all began in third grade primary school when I pooped my pants. <laughs> okay, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a 2 p.m. on a Tuesday afternoon, I'm trying to recall my memory, and I was getting ready for science class. And you know, I was excited. Well, science wasn't my favorite class, but I was ready for class, right? But, you know, all of a sudden, right as my science teacher is walking into the door, I hear a sense of, I hear a bit of grumbling in my stomach. I had a bit too much adobo, which is my favorite oily-based kind of dish, a Filipino cuisine. And right there and then, right when my teacher's walking in the door, I literally dropped the bomb. <laughs> Bro, I pooped my pants. <laughs> There I, and there I was, eight-year-old me, not really knowing what to do. I thought my life was over. I thought my academic standing was over. Mom, I couldn't make valedictorian in preschool. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's over. But 30 to 40 minutes after that, in came a fresh set of clothes. I didn't call home. I didn't tell my mom I pooped my pants. Messenger wasn't a thing back then. I'm pretty sure TikTok wasn't either. But Turns out it was my domestic worker. After my class advisor called home, um, she was immediately told, my domestic worker was immediately told <laughs> that um, I needed a fresh set of clothes. And there I was, all changed, in my favorite set of Vance, black and white Vance, off the wall, um, and proceeded my day. Now, while this story might seem really trivial, you know, <laughs> this is my story of how I began to meet, understand, and appreciate my domestic worker. So I'm a recent graduate at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Anyone from CU? I see you. <laughs> you know? And um, I came from a very values-driven and empathetic family, accepting family in the Philippines. My family's domestic worker, Riza, has been, been a part of my family for 16 years. And you know, not long after dropping the bomb, <laughs> Riza became my best friend. You know, many people like Riza, I learned, have dreams of pursuing greener pastures, supporting their families. You know, for Riza, that was to help her family set up a convenience store in Camotes, a small um, island in the Philippines, and help them overcome intergenerational financial trouble. You know? And many of them go to Hong Kong. You know, in Hong Kong specifically, there are over 350,000 migrant domestic workers in the city, 5% of the population who make huge contributions to the city. Um, ever since the 1970s, as a result of Chinese economic reform that has made Hong Kong an investment gateway to, all, to, to, to mainland China all around the world, many local um, middle-class Hong Kongers have shifted to service-based jobs, right? including women. And so as a result of this, migrant domestic workers suddenly rose in demand. So that's the history. right? But from Poland to Saudi Arabia to Hong Kong, no matter where it is, emerging countries all the world and their workforce require domestic workers. And so it's important that we value them. Domestic workers, migrant domestic workers, are the backbone of Hong Kong's economy, and they contribute 3.6 percent, you know, 99 billion to Hong, um, billion dollars to Hong Kong's economy. They're employed by one in seven local Hong Kong households and help over 120,000 working-age local Hong Kong moms re-enter the workforce. 99 billion, right? And as a result, by 2038, the number of elderly in Hong Kong is projected to grow to up to 30 percent. The expected number of domestic workers is 600,000, also doubling. But let's go back to that number. 99 billion Hong Kong dollars. What does that even mean? It's a big number. It's a billion. But to put that into perspective, 
That's enough money to finance the four-year undergraduate experience of 160,000 HKU international students. It's a lot of money. And so, through the cleaning, the elderly care, the house care, the child care, the cooking, the adobo, that all these domestic workers provide, domestic workers are not just the backbone of Hong Kong's economy, they're the backbone of Hong Kong's society. And so it's important that we care for them. But I'm left with so many questions. Why is it that in their once a week Sunday holidays, they still stay in the busy streets of Central while you and I get to spend time with our friends and at their homes? We get to go to fancy nice bars, go, to, go party at LKF, or maybe just shop by the mall. Why are there domestic workers that fail to still receive their basic employment entitlements, receive their wages on time? While you and I, especially I'm calling all my students, get to brush up our CVs and have the prestigious opportunity to apply to multinational investment banks, conglomerates, CPG firms, and whatnot. And finally, why are there still reports, outlines, or maybe simply documentaries of dom domestic workers who can't have their basic needs met, like food on the table, a bed, medical supplies, while well, you and I have the love, the care, the support of our friends, our families back home and abroad. Why? Domestic workers have so, lack so many things that you and I deem as given. And I think this is exacerbated by three major issues. Number one, gender and racial discrimination. Because 98.5% of domestic workers are women and come from emerging countries like Philippines, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, the great majority of Hong Kong people still think domestic workers are cheap labor. But how about the patience that they have to adjust to a completely new culture that is not their own? How about the endurance to work 96 hours per week while making one third of regular minimum wage? And finally, how about the responsibility that they provide to be both the primary caregivers of their families and also, remember, the primary breadwinners of their families back home, which sometimes, by the way, are as large as 12th. Financial obligation, making a monthly minimum wage of about $4,730, again, one third of the non-regular, a non-domestic worker minimum wage. Domestic workers to make about 55,000 Hong Kong dollars a year. Now, although that might not seem like a lot to us, you and me, this is a lot to them. This is enough to finance one year of college education for four children, for four kids. It's enough to finance also an entire new home. And it's also enough to finance a complete change, a permanent change in their diet. From, high qual from, from, from canned veggies and fish, or canned fish and veggies, <laughs> to high quality proteins like pork, beef, chicken, milk, and the Filipino favorite, Jollibee. <laughs> Yet, they contribute 80% and send that to their families, leaving them with about 11,000, or 900 HKD a month. To put that into perspective, that's 3% of, of, the, of the mean average salary for an HKU fresh grad. Is that a lot of money? Finally, access to legal rights. Market domestic workers, though protected by a 17-clause standard employment contract, fail to receive the proper education, protection, and enforcement of their legal rights. In a 2017 study by Legal Services Charity Mission for Migrant Workers, it was found that three in five, or more than 200,000 migrant domestic workers, do not have a room to sleep in. But that doesn't really come as a surprise when, according to the Census and Statistics Department, more than 90% of domestic worker employers are sized at four people or less. And in this economy, you know how much it costs to have that extra room. So where do domestic workers sleep in? I'll leave that to your imagination. This is exacerbated by a live-in rule, which requires all domestic workers to live with their employers, you know, stay with them in their homes, which leads to long working hours, 16, 17 hours a day, 96 hours a week. Verbal and physical abuse, sometimes being shouted on the daily, sometimes being slapped, sometimes sleeping on top of the washing machine. And contract breaches, where they're not able to receive their monthly wage, they don't receive them on time, they don't receive quality food or quality meds. Is this right? Is this humane? Do domestic workers or any human being reserve, deserve to be treated like this? Our community, our nonprofit sector needs you. And so I propose three ways to do that. Talk to them. 
There's a lot that you can do. There's a lot that you can learn by simply having an open, an honest conversation with people that you think are not like you. Now for me, um, you know, while I was the mischievous, disrespectful, and well, academically dishonest child when I was growing up, I heavily relied on my childhood domestic worker, especially for math. No wonder she was a mathematics graduate in college. Um, but really with Riza specifically, as I got older, at the ripe age of 11, I realized that she was more than just the person who woke me up at 7 a.m. She was more than just the person that packed my basketball clothing every morning. She was, or she is, a human being. She's just like me, the breadwinner of her family in Komotes Island, that there's 350 plus thousand of her in Hong Kong with dreams. And she's just like you and me, again, young, with dreams, with so much ahead of them, so much in store. And so I encourage you to do the same. There is so much that you can learn by simply having a, an open and honest conversation. Go to the streets right now, talk to them. You'll realize that they're no different from your moms who care for their kids and want to support them. They're no different from your sisters who serve as role models or maybe even you know, the, the main source of income to help finally get that first child in the family to go to college. And they're, not, and they're no different from you and me who have dreams who are young, who have so much in store. Second, volunteer. There is so much that you can give by simply devoting some of your personal time, some of your personal hours to give some charitable manpower. For me, when, it was, when, the, when the COVID-19 pandemic started, I started to get a little homesick. I wanted to go home. But as you all know, Hong Kong's flight restrictions were crazy. 21 days in the hotel. Um, lots of flight restrictions. I didn't have that vaccine at the time. So I wasn't able to go home. But it was a blessing in disguise because while I was sad, that was also when I started volunteering for Help for Domestic Workers, uh, a nonprofit organization that provides free advice to domestic workers. And through that experience, I learned and was exposed to the plethora of challenges by migrant domestic workers. One case I specifically remember um, came from an Indian woman. Her name was Mira. I'll call her Mira for the purpose of this talk. Um, and I found out that she wasn't paid um, her monthly wages for six months. Now, although we were able to eventually solve her case, teach Mira to take some photographic evidence to submit to the labor department, what really shocked me <laughs> was that for six months, she wasn't aware of her rights. For six months. So I encourage you to volunteer because volunteering is more than just the charitable manpower you provide. It is the mental the emotional investment you give to your underserved communities. And now more than ever, our communities need you. And finally, I encourage you to take that leap, especially for my young, for my fellow um, for university students out there. You are much, you have so much untapped potential to do great things, just haven't done it yet. And so after three years of being a part of this sector, or um, at the time, two years, I started to do more than just volunteer. I started to write papers about the, the, the deficiencies, the issues, the challenges faced by the nonprofit sector. I wrote papers about the financial conditions of domestic workers. I wrote a thesis paper about minimum wage. Um, I started working part-time with help and help hundreds of high school students learn about the issues about their ates, their tetes, their nanas that they never really knew. And more recently, I started a, so I co-founded with my friends a social startup called HelpBridge has helped thousands of domestic workers be digitally informed on their most pressing concerns. Again, you have so much potential. Go start that domestic worker club. Go write that paper, that contentious paper about the issues surrounding you. Or simply have that conversation with your friend, your, your, your parents, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, and think about how we as a forthcoming generation can finally bring substantial day-to-day -day change or just start that passion project. You have so much untapped potential. But taking a step back from all this, right? this is not just a talk about helping domestic workers. This is a talk about helping all underserved communities in general. How can we create a more inclusive society, a more inclusive Hong Kong that accepts people of all backgrounds? How can we redefine what it means to be a part of Hong Kong. Can't we change that narrative? And while I'm confident that change is possible, 
domestic workers are a part of Hong Kong. And it's high time that we challenge that status quo, take that first step, so that the next time we have this TEDx conference, they're right here, standing with us, clapping with us, talking with us. But this goes without saying. We've got a long way to go. And so I'm gonna choose to keep doing this. But if you could, do one, if you could take one takeaway from my entire talk, it would be this. You do not need to have a big head to have a big heart. Empathy goes a long way. And well, maybe, yeah, maybe big change is what we need. But I say it starts with taking those small, daily, incremental steps to serve our society. So I'm going to choose to keep helping people just like Riza. I'm going to choose to keep devoting my Sundays to volunteering. I'm going to choose to keep doing what I think I feel deep down in my heart can be a representation of a better Hong Kong. My only question now is, will you join me? Thank you.